they all reacted indifferently, completely detached from the facts. Everyone knows that he's a psychopath and a manipulator. He finds joy and pleasure from seeing the suffering of others. I told him there is a guy who's just left my place about to kidnap a girl. He's armed. I think he's about to do something horrific. Please act quickly. On Monday, May 1st, 2005, at 5.45 p.m., the Aigmort police station received a strange call warning them about a planned abduction of an unnamed woman that was about to play out. The caller didn't say much, just that the crime was set to occur at around 6 p.m. He added that the abductor was armed and was driving a green Seat Ibiza, but when asked to identify the perpetrator, the man refused. He asserted that the culprit was dangerous and that he couldn't give more information as he feared for his life. Still, officers swiftly sprung into action because this report came from Dominique Tarasco, a well-connected underground nightclub owner known to give away details of misdemeanors in exchange for his club's protection. This is someone who knows all the nightclubs in the area. He is able to make calls and find out what's going on. Following Tarasco's tip, the police discreetly observed the area around the bar he mentioned. However, it was a three-day weekend. So many people were up and about, making it difficult to spot potential wrongdoings. What made things worse was officers didn't know who they were on the lookout for, as they weren't given any physical description of the victim or the suspect. After about an hour of surveillance with no promising leads, the cops asked their source for more information, but he continued withholding the kidnapper's identity. During this conversation, Tarasco realized he had incorrectly described the abductor's car. It was a gray Citroen ZX, not the green Seat Ibiza he had the authorities frantically scouring for. It was a case which never got off the ground, a case where information had to be checked, but without a crime and without legal framework. It just became a sort of rescue mission. Everyone knew they had wasted valuable time, and the criminal may have slipped under their nose. Still, the cops told Tarasco not to worry and to let them handle the investigation. Sadly, nothing came of this tip. Officers had no new evidence, and the information they got led to nothing, so they had no choice but to drop the case. Hours later, at around 1 a.m., Tarasco was on his way home from a dinner filled with heavy drinking when he came across a checkpoint. Not knowing the investigation was discontinued, he thought the police had widened their search for the kidnapper's car. He thought that a large-scale operation was in place to stop the car of his friend. However, the roadblock was just a routine inspection unrelated to the case. Heedless, Tarasco confidently approached the cops, asking about their operation. On the other hand, Law enforcement thought the drunk man was talking nonsense. He kept probing the clueless officers about the case, causing quite a commotion. At that exact moment, a gray Citroen ZX passed by, driven by a man with a woman who looked asleep in the passenger seat. Tarasco pointed out the car, demanding the cops to arrest that driver when his phone suddenly rang. It was the criminal they were looking for. He had called Tarasco to warn him about that very checkpoint. When he hung up, the informant told the officers he was just on the phone with the kidnapper, proving that the car that passed them was the one they were after. And I said, that's him. Do something. Arrest him. Stop him now. That's the guy. However, this led to nothing. The police at the checkpoint had no idea what he was talking about, since they weren't involved in the case he reported. With that, they sent him home with a warning. And then they send him on his way. They tell him, listen now, stop it, you're pissing us off, get out of here. Following that incident, the case was all but forgotten. It wasn't until two days later, on May 4, 2005, that a seemingly unrelated missing person case popped up in Marseille. A man named Silvone reported that his wife, aspiring model Elodie Morel, had been missing for about 48 hours. He informed police that he hadn't been able to contact her after the last messages she sent at 9.30 p.m the day she vanished. He told them that Elodie had signed up for a casting website in late April. From there, she met a photographer named Nicole Forestier, who offered her a five-day photo shoot for Rolls-Royce that paid 1,000 euro per day with food and lodging covered by the production. Not having any prior experience, the aspiring model saw this as a fantastic opportunity and agreed to the terms. The women then settled the contract and set up the photo shoot for May 2nd. On the morning of their meetup, Elodie went all out. She packed all her favorite clothes and applied her most flattering makeup to ensure she looked her best. Believing this was the start of her career, 
she happily bade farewell to her husband and son to drive up to their rendezvous. That was the last time Sylvain saw his wife. He feared that Elodie had been kidnapped and insisted that the police needed to do something before she was transported out of the country or worse. Unfortunately, Sylvain wasn't taken seriously because he admitted to having marital problems in the last couple of months. The officers he talked to assumed that a natural beauty like his wife had an affair and just ran away. The man refuted such claims. He stated that even though she was happy to land her first modeling job, Elodie worried about leaving their son for a few days and was mainly concerned as this was the longest she'd been away from her family. Despite the officers believing that this wasn't an urgent case, Sylvain insisted that something was wrong. With this, the cops were convinced to launch a nationwide investigation by sending posters to different police stations all over the country. Il a ce pressentiment que quelque chose de pas normal est arrivé parce qu'il sait très bien que son épouse va prendre contact avec lui, va le tenir informé. Meanwhile, upon receiving word of this missing woman, law enforcement at Aigmore immediately connected this case to the tip they received from Tarasco. Detectives contacted Sylvan, who readily gave them everything he knew, including Elodie's cell phone number. This allowed the authorities to track the woman's movement on the day of her disappearance. Her digital trace confirmed that Elodie was in the region. It showed that she went to Aigmore, Saint Laurent des Gouze, Saint Gilles, then Vauvert, where all traces of her were lost by the evening of May 2nd. Realizing how serious things were, investigators set up a police base in Vauvert, the victim's last known location. They combed through the vast area but found nothing. With so little information, the police were stuck and had no other choice but to interrogate their informant. The next day, on May 5th, cops demanded Tarasco to give up the name of Elodie's attacker. They threatened to arrest him and emphasized how grim things were for the abducted woman. Eventually, the man cracked under pressure and identified the perpetrator. It was a man named Guillaume Mingo, one of the security guards who worked in Tarasco's nightclub. Detectives looked into Mingo and learned that he had been previously convicted. In July 1997, he picked up two hitchhiking female tourists whom he then attacked and threatened. For these crimes, he was sentenced to nine years in prison. From there, his felonies became increasingly violent and gun-related. If he was refused anything, there would be an explosion of violence. With such a dangerous abductor, the police had to set out a trap to save Elodie. They asked Tarasco to lure Mingod with an enticing job offer they'd need to discuss in person. The suspect agreed to meet at the parking lot of the old nightclub, La Mexicana, at 6 p.m. However, he also informed Tarasco that he was bringing an accomplice, making the entrapment even more nerve-wracking. When a white van pulled in at the agreed-upon time, the law enforcement agents immediately descended upon the vehicle. Mingod made a run for it, but was apprehended right away. Investigators then conducted a body search and found Elodie's credit card in the suspect's pocket. He insisted that he had randomly found it at a bar and kept it as he planned to return it to the owner. Meanwhile, back at the van, the cops arrested Mingod's associate, Richard Ligné. He was a local family man with no prior criminal convictions. He isn't known as being a member of a criminal or international sex trafficking gang. He's just a nobody from the area. Police learned that Ligné was the suspect's longtime friend, with whom he stayed whenever he was in the area. This information cracked the case wide open, as detectives finally had a location. Ligné's residence in Vergès. They headed to the address straight away, hoping to find Elodie alive even after four days of captivity. But what happened when they got there stunned law enforcement. Ligné's wife, Francine, and their daughter were calmly eating dinner when the police arrived. As they searched everywhere, the two continued their meal as though nothing unusual was happening. The police believed that Mrs. Ligné and her daughter knew. Investigators were unable to find Elodie, but they found some peculiar items. Lying around the house were a dress, two pairs of shoes, a black t-shirt, and a cell phone, all of which belonged to Elodie. Another item recovered was a revolver with brownish stains believed to be blood, making it clear that the Liniers were connected to the case. So then there was absolutely no doubt that Elodie Morel had been there. With this, police brought in Mingo and his accomplices, Mr. and Mrs. Ligniers, for questioning. At around 8 p.m. on the same day, the collaborators were interrogated separately. During this, Mingo remained indifferent, trying to manipulate investigators and throwing them off. 
When detectives showed him pictures of the victim, he claimed to have seen Elodie in passing the night he found her credit card. He also remained uncaring when they presented him with the gun found in the Ligné household. Having made no progress in interrogating their prime suspect, the police turned their attention to Richard Ligné, who caved and told them his account of what happened. And then, looking at him straight in the eye, I told him, I know that you know. You know what has happened. It wasn't you, but you know. And he looked at me emptily and said, yes. According to Ligné, Mingo showed up unannounced at their house on the morning of May 1st, claiming to be contracted to slay someone for 5,000 euro. After spending time together, Ligné claimed that Mingo left around 9 o'clock or 9.30 p.m., driving away in a gray Citron ZX. He insisted that he didn't see his guest again until the early hours of Tuesday, May 3rd, when Minga burst in holding a pistol and exclaiming that the hit had gone wrong. The man urgently demanded to use the family's garage, admitting that he had a woman in his car whom he needed to hide. With no questions asked, Ligné agreed and even opened the door to help the criminal get his Citron ZX inside. Ligné maintained that he didn't see nor hear anything or anyone. Eventually, Mingo asked for plastic cable ties and declared that he would sleep in the garage as he wanted to rest and ensure that his captive stayed silent. The homeowner also said that he left Mingo alone afterward and went about his day, even going to work as usual. More spine-chilling details about the case were revealed when Francine Ligné was questioned. She explained that at about 6 p.m. the same day, Mungo returned to the house asking for water for his captive. He even disclosed that his victim was thirsty because of the substance he gave her. Allegedly, Mingaud spent more than two hours in the garage before joining the family for dinner. This time, he brought the Ligniers' gifts. A dress, two pairs of shoes, and a black t-shirt. He also gave the couple a cell phone, which they immediately handed to their daughter as they thought she needed one. Moi, je les ai prises. Après, moi j'étais petite, j'ai pas vu le mal. On me donne des choses, moi je les prends. Après, voilà, personne s'est posé de questions. After that, the family remained detached and insensitive. They were aware that their guest abducted a woman. They did nothing to save Elodie Morel and let her suffer at the hands of Guillaume Mengaud. Mrs. Ligné added that Mengaud mentioned how he planned to get rid of the victim over dinner. Not only did the couple's statements prove that Mengaud had abducted Elodie, but it was also a strong indication that he had killed her. When law enforcement confronted him with this information, Mingaud finally admitted to creating the online casting call using a fake woman's name. He used the listing as bait, and when he received an email from Elodie, she fit the profile he was looking for. Elodie was the perfect prey, so Mingaud set the meeting on that fateful Monday. By 6.30 p.m. on May 2nd, Elodie arrived at the bar looking for a female photographer only to come face to face with a man claiming to be that photographer's assistant. He manipulated her into trusting him, and then persuaded her to join him in touring the locations for their photo shoot. Mingal claimed that this trip, which took about four hours, was a ruse to steal her credit card and to get her to tell him her pin. Supposedly, he stopped at a narrow path and robbed her at around 4.30 a.m. the following day. At that time, Elodie put her hands near her kidnapper to defend herself. This angered her captor, so he attacked her until she told him the pin. She was about to make a seemingly trivial gesture, bringing her hand to his buddy, and he didn't like it, so he hit her violently. He insisted that he had set her free once she gave him what he wanted, and that was the last time they crossed paths. Needless to say, no one believed Mingaw's absurd tale, notably because it directly contradicted the Ligné statements. Unknown to the suspect, police were already searching the garage the couple mentioned. There, they found incriminating evidence such as footprints, cable ties, and a bottle of water fitting the description given by Mrs. Ligné. There were also traces of blood, and more than 30 butts of cigarettes of the same brand as that of Mingot's, corroborating that he had spent a lot of time in said garage. Detectives also came across the gray Citroen ZX, where they found the white powder the female accomplice mentioned in her statement. Analysis showed that it was a mixture of stolen sedatives, suggesting that Elodie wasn't conscious during the harrowing ordeal. About 23 hours in, after law enforcement presented him with all the evidence they found, Mingo changed his version of what happened. He admitted to taking Elodie to the garage, where he allegedly stole her bank card, but planned to free her in exchange for her silence. 
He stressed that Elodie was not tied up, and they just killed time chatting until enough time passed. Mingo claimed that by daybreak he had driven her back to her car in Eggmore, where things had taken a dark turn. He told investigators that Elodie suddenly tripped him, causing him to fall to the ground. He was outraged, so when he saw a string on the ground, he used it to end her life. To find Elodie's body, detectives had to manipulate and flatter the criminal until he gave away that he hit her in the trunk of her BMW car parked at the Eggmort Cemetery. Uh, la, bon, on est quand même au mois de mai, il fait assez chaud, donc le, le, le corps a, a assez souffert. Finally, authorities recovered Elodie Morel's lifeless body. Though recovering her gave them closure, the confirmation of her death broke her family's heart. On a l'impression que tout, tout tombe dessus et on ne comprend même pas. C'est tellement foudroyant. After a forensics examination, police concluded that she had suffered more injuries than the ones Mingaud admitted to, proving that her death was not accidental. From the bottle found at the Ligné's garage, the authorities found Elodie's DNA mixed with discharge from Mingaud and the substance he previously gave her to keep her docile. This proved that the captor rendered the woman helpless and unable to refuse his advances. With the evidence lined up, Richard and Francine Lignier were charged for their part in the abduction and death of Elodie Morel on May 7, 2005. On the other hand, Guillaume Mangot was placed on house arrest for the multiple crimes he committed against the model. On January 28, 2008, Guillaume Mangot, Richard Lignier, and Francine Lignier were put on trial, facing life imprisonment. As the proceedings began, the husband and wife remained stoic while the main defendant put up an arrogant air that made everyone in court uneasy. Mingaud smiled, maintained eye contact, and made an outlandish statement that shocked the people present that day. He claimed that he wasn't Elodie's attacker. It was Richard Lignier. This assertion shocked his accomplice so much that he collapsed on the spot and needed to be hospitalized, disrupting the court proceedings. The trial was suspended until the next day, when Lignier was brought in via stretcher. Meanwhile, the prosecution accused the primary suspect of attempting to manipulate and mislead the jurors. They also had to re-establish the facts of the case, reiterating that evidence all pointed toward Mingor. Regardless, the man continued to point his finger at Lignier. He proclaimed that he loved the victim and insisted that he did not hurt her. He continued to mock the court, clearly guilty of the crimes against Elodie. On the other hand, the couple defended themselves by stating they had no idea what happened. They asserted that they did not see or hear anything, and thus did not intervene. After a five-day trial, Richard and Francine Lignier were sentenced to six years for failing to report the crime. For them, they had something to pay, because they were going to go. Moreover, Guillaume Mengot was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Sadly, the case didn't end there. Elodie's abductor filed for an appeal, and a second trial took place in May 2010. This time, he was sentenced to 30 years with a minimum of 20 years without parole. The couple also appealed, but had theirs increased to eight years. To this day, Guillaume Mengot remains in prison, paying for the crimes he committed against Elodie Morel. Meanwhile, Dominique Tarasco, who was never charged for the case, publicly stated his regret for the part he played in the ordeal. He claimed to still wrestle with the guilt of not fully cooperating with law enforcement immediately. I do still have regrets. I tell myself I could have saved this girl because I knew enough. By contrast, Elodie's husband, Sylvan, remains silent about her fate. He continues to care for their son, keeping the child his priority. Despite Elodie no longer being by his side, he fulfills his wife's dreams of a happy, safe, and healthy home for their boy. Meanwhile, Elodie's mother continues to grieve for her beautiful daughter, who was taken too soon. Elle avançait, mais elle avait beaucoup de cœur. Elle savait ce qu'elle voulait. C'était une une jeune femme très volontaire, Elodie. Je je suis toujours avec elle dans la pensée. Il y a des moments c'est plus difficile, mais c'est certain. Et plus les années passent, plus l'absence est difficile. On ne cicatrise jamais. On fait avec. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.